Thank you very much. Um, so I won't um, dwell too much on the this um, topic, or this, this slide just here, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. Um, osteoporosis and osteoarthritis are clearly aligned with advancing age. They're diseases that, um, as, as we age, the risk for these increase. So that's why I fit quite nicely into here and not the, um, the youngies. So thanks for coming. Um, can you just, do I just try the slides here? I haven't got a clicker. Yeah. So I'll just start while we're getting there. I'm actually feeling a bit privileged to follow Helen on from her presentation because she so eloquently described what the social gradient of health is. Um, she really knows her stuff, which is fantastic. So she's given you a really good overview of, of what that actually is. I was just going to briefly touch on this model. This is um, from uh, Dahlgren and Whitehead. It's also commonly referred to as a social rainbow. This gives us a bit of an idea of the population being um, in the middle and they're actually surrounded by these different levels, overarching factors here, individual, social, infrastructure and uh, policy. And all of these things impact on the individual or the, the population at the centre. This model doesn't really give us such a good idea of the interaction and the complexity of all these factors, but it does, does give us a bit of a, a really um, basic foundation for understanding. What this shows us is that social stratification does engender different exposure to health outcomes, um, disease vulnerability, material resources that can actually have a protective effect, uh, effect on, on our health outcomes. And also these factors all influence our health literacy or our understanding and access to information regarding health. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So again, Helen um, beautifully spoke to this. So just briefly, we can see a social gradient of health in many diseases. We see it in uh, respiratory disorders. We see it uh, breast cancer, liver disease, accidents there. We see it around the world. So this social gradient of health goes from the top to the bottom of the socioeconomic spectrum. It's a global phenomenon. It affects low countries, uh, low income countries, but also middle and high income countries. So we're actually not, um, um, protected against this inequity. Uh, next one, thanks. So just briefly, these two diseases, as I said, they're related to age. Osteoarthritis, um, it's a disease of the whole joint. It's characterised by the painful swollen joints and loss of function, and you can see a, a person up the top there. There's no cure for it. Public health expenditure is quite high, four billion annually. That's quite a lot out of the health system and also out of people's pockets too. And the biggest expenditure is due to pain relief and joint replacement surgery for end stage disease. The other disease, next slide please, is osteoporosis. This is also um, a, a musculoskeletal disease. It's a disease of the bone, uh, results in a weakening of the bone matrix. So on the, the top left there, you can see a normal bone um, and then you can see the osteoporotic bone, which is very porous and a degradation of that bone matrix. A lot of people have it aged 50 years and over, uh, and the public health expenditure for this a couple of years ago is 2.75 billion annually. Again, big uh, expenditure on the health system. So whilst we see a social gradient of health in many diseases, there's not that much evidence before our work to show that it also exists in musculoskeletal uh, disorder. So I wanna show you how we've actually harnessed the big data, big data sets, and also linked um, big data in different ways to actually present this social gradient of musculoskeletal disease. So when we're actually talking about this social gradient, we really need to say that it is observed in bones too. So next slide, please. Um, so that's just what, what we're going to do. What have we done? What do we know now about the social gradient of musculoskeletal disorders? Thank you. Okay, so we have some large data sets that we've linked. Now, Helen spoke about data linkage. Uh, we have done this data linkage a few different ways. What it ultimately gives us is we're accessing big data sets out there in, in the you know, Australia level, Australian level. And also by linking them and joining them in certain ways, we have even bigger data sets. But she's right in saying that there are actually at the moment very disparate, they sit alone. So I'm gonna focus on how I've used the ABS um, data and to link with these different factors. ABS data, we know they give us the C for values, the ARIA, the Accessibility and Remoteness Index of Australia. So I'm not gonna dwell too much on, on the ABS, but I will touch on it. And the, the data sets I've linked with is the longitudinal GOSS data set, patient records, so hospital records, uh, a comprehensive fracture grid, and also a national registry. So if we just go on to the next slide. 
Briefly, we know that census is held every five years. It's got, it, we give individual level data, but the ABS actually aggregates it into uh, indexes, aggregate levels. Um, that's the CIFA that Helen spoke of. Uh, it's, it's strong data, even though it's self-reported, but it's basically everybody. Um, we can argue that it does encompass everybody or not. We can have a good debate about that. Uh, and as I mentioned, that ARIA index. So we get a lot of information from the ABS. Next one, thank you. This is where it gets interesting. If we use epidemiological data, which is um, population-based data, we actually get a lot more value out of linking with big data sets at the Australian level. So the Geelong Osteoporosis Study is one of them. This is a longitudinal cohort, so it was first established in 93, 94. It encompasses a full defined geographic area. And David Ashbridge talked about the, the importance of that this morning too. Um, the GOSS study randomly recruited a population-based age stratified sample. And they have at the moment two cohorts, a, men, a male and female, about 3,000 at baseline for both of those combined. So the importance of being randomly recruited is that can be representative of the population. And this cohort has actually been linked with Medicare Australia data, national death indexes, again, big data sets, strong data sets. You, if you, the, Medica sorry, if the data is in these data sets, it's a given. So this cohort, the epidemiological um, um, cohort, it follows a group of people over time. So we've got basically 20 years of data or up to 20 years of data, lifestyle, um, demographics, disease, all those sort of different measures that you actually don't get from big data sets. So the benefit of linking this, an epi study, with big data sets gives us so much more information. So next slide, thank you. This is the patient administrative data set that I was talking about, the Geelong Bone Densitometry Service. So we've used data from there. This encompasses um, um, one major service provider, meaning anybody who has a DEXA or a bone density scan shown there, they actually are in this data set. So it's comprehensive. Um, of course, if you're going for a bone density scan, you're referred, so you have a Medicare uh, item number there. And the next data set, slide, thanks is the GOSS fracture grid associated with the Geelong osteoporosis study, but keep in mind it's a different data set. This is a comprehensive, relatively comprehensive fracture register for that defined BSD region, the Barnes Statistical Division. It employed computerised keyword searches and it's cross-referenced with radiological reports. It's very strong data. Everybody who had a fracture in the BSD, from zero up to however long you want to live, is actually in this data set, this register. So it's quite strong. Now you can already see the, start, the, you know, the level of value. They're not quite linked just yet. So next one. This is the final data set that I wanted to talk about. This is a national registry. This um, was set up for public and private hospitals across Australia to give information about joint, replacement re um, joint replacements. It started with the knee and the hip, then it went on to include the shoulder, now includes other stuff. But I wanted to um, look at outcomes following joint replacement. So it's a really strong registry and it actually has 99% completeness because they do cross-reference with a few different, um, oh, I've listed them there, which is good, <laughs> government separation data, uh, health department unit record, and they use, you know, really complex matching um, to check it. So let's move on. So what does this do? Next slide. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, so these are some of the results. These, I'm going to tell you which data sets we're actually linked up to give this information but I want to before I go into this highlight the difficulties in linking ethical approval you can link from your epi data set to say the registry but you can only link the people you have in your epi data set to that registry or you can get information from registry registries and out but you don't know who they are there's different ways to link Canada is another um, country that does it well Helen listed a few countries Canada has uh, population-wide or province-wide data sets, administrative data sets of everything you think of. Welfare, medical appointments, medication, everything is actually in one data set. We have to do it a little bit harder here at the moment. So by linking the, um, the GOSS EPI cohort with the ABS C for data, we found this. That lower SES is associated with lifestyles known to increase the risk of the musculoskeletal disorders. It's not too surprising we've got the weight is higher in the most disadvantaged, waist <coughs> circumference, smoking status, etc. But that gives us an idea that the risk factors for disease are actually higher if you're disadvantaged compared to not. 
Next slide. We also found that differences exist in the fracture rates across the SES continuum. So as Helen was saying, a lot of these diseases and, and childhood factors and mortality, um, there is a social gradient. We see it in musculoskeletal disorders. On the left here, we have the hip fracture incidence. Oh, have you been saying finish a lot? I'm so sorry, I thought this was really cool. Okay, I'll just whip through. So we see that. Next slide, thank you. Next thing, you throw something at me. Um, we'll just nick, lick, um, skip through that too. Uh, policy changes, just quickly, Medicare Australia in 2007 introduced changes to Medicare re reimbursement for um, DEXA. It actually didn't have much impact. So we looked at uh, uptake on DEXA before and after, didn't really change it. Disappointing, we need to do more. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is joint replacement. There's that social gradient. Next slide, thank you. Uh oh, what does all this mean? Okay, next slide. <laughs> it means that important clinical implications. I'm so sorry I went over time. Thank you.